Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining, and I hope you're all well, hope you're all vaccinated, hope you're all wearing masks and being socially distant from one another. This thing is really dangerous. Be careful. It's been a difficult start to the year, as we all know, but we're heading in the right direction in the fight against the pandemic. And today's special guest has played an important role in our country's progress. His work have helped to say, has worked to save a lot of lives over the years. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy. We're looking forward to hearing his insights on the state of the pandemic and the future of American health, because the fact is our country was facing many serious public health challenges before COVID arrived. And over the past two years, they have grown only more urgent with deaths from guns and opioids skyrocketing. Our foundation has begun working on these issues long before the pandemic struck. And over the past two years, we've ramped up our efforts. Many of you have been key partners and others have made it possible through the work you do at our company and our foundation. The Surgeon General has been a leader on those issues too, and many more. And we're glad to have him with us today. He may not remember this, but I mentioned him in the commencement address I delivered at Harvard University some years ago. It was during the Obama administration and the gun lobby was blocking his nomination to be Surgeon General because he had the audacity to say that gun violence is a public health crisis. Sadly, that was only a preview of the way that politics has come to influence public health and science. But we aren't giving up the fight and neither is he. In a moment, he'll join a conversation with the head of our public health team at Bloomberg Philanthropies, Dr. Kelly Henning. She and her team really have done a phenomenal job leading our work to confront the biggest threats to American health. So Kelly, the Zoom is yours. Thank you so much for that warm welcome, Mike. I really appreciate it. The US is now emerging from the Omicron peak, but there's still lots of unanswered questions that we all have about the pandemic. And then on top of that, as Mike mentioned, we have other public health issues that are in fact worsening during this COVID moment, including things like the overdose epidemic. So today I'm so delighted to have a conversation with Dr. Vivek Morthy, who is the US Surgeon General. He's serving in this role for the second time. He's a trusted voice on issues of public health and he serves the most vulnerable, both in the US and abroad. And so we're very fortunate to have him with us today. Hello, Dr. Morthy. Hello, it's so good to see you, Kelly. Thanks for having me to be part of this conversation. Yeah, it's great to have you here. So I wanna just jump right in with the COVID question right off the bat. Sure. What does the world look like post Omicron? What do you think is coming next? Can you let us know? Well, Kelly, you know, I, I'll tell you, uh, I wish I had a crystal ball because this uh, COVID pandemic has thrown many curveballs at us. and. It hasn't always been easy to anticipate what comes next, but I will tell you this, I, I do feel more hopeful about what comes after Omicron uh, than I have at any other point during the pandemic. And it's not because I know exactly what will come. We may see a period of, of low cases uh, for a while after the Omicron wave recedes. Um, there potentially may be uh, waves of old or new variants that may surface uh, you know, in the months ahead. But the reason I actually feel more hopeful is because I actually believe that we have more tools to deal with these various scenarios uh, than we had even just six months ago and certainly uh, compared to a year ago. Uh, I think about the future as hopefully being a state of equilibrium that we can reach, a, a state where we reduce the, the toll that the virus takes on our health, but we, we also minimize the costly disruptions that we've experienced to school, to workplaces, uh, and just to people's lives uh, in general, because those disruptions also have consequences for people's mental and physical health, for social cohesion, uh, for child development, for education, and for the economy. But in this equilibrium state, I think that we can actually learn to, uh, we can move from a state of being, having our lives be defined by COVID to a state where we are managing COVID uh, and actually getting on with our lives. Uh, so it's going to take, uh, you know, the right tools. And we have some of those. We've got uh, right now life-saving vaccines, uh, which have proven even in the Omicron wave, uh, to reduce the likelihood that somebody ends up in the hospital or they die from this infection. Uh, we have a growing arsenal of therapeutics, both now intravenous and oral medications, which, uh, which are very effective at, uh, again, saving people's lives and keeping them out of the hospital. And each month that goes by, Kelly, we have more and more supply 
uh, of these therapeutics as well, uh, which bodes well. Uh, and we also now have other mitigation measures that are more and more accessible to the public. You think about the data uh, that is now you know, increasingly showing that high quality masks help not only to reduce the spread of infection, but also to help protect the person wearing the mask uh, from getting infected themselves. You think about tests, which are increasingly available uh, you know, across the country where we have more and more supply coming in. These are additional tools that we can use strategically uh, to help identify and contain information and rather infection. So you put all of this together, Kelly, and you I, I imagine a future where even though COVID may still be around, even though there may be waves of old and new variants that may surface, where we have more and more tools to be able to keep people out of the hospital to save their lives and help them do the things that are so important to them, like keeping their kids in school, like making sure people can see their loved ones and that we can get back to work. Well, thank you for that. And I'm gonna circle back on vaccines in just a minute. But before we go back there, you talked about tools at our disposal, but one of the things that we're really facing is an epidemic, epidemic of misinformation, if you will. And this has been really problematic for trying to deal with the pandemic. Can you give us some of your thoughts on how best to address this issue? I'm glad you raised this, Kelly, because the power of misinformation uh, is really staggering. We have seen, even during this pandemic alone, that health misinformation has led people to make decisions that have ultimately not been in their best interests, that have <clears throat> often not served them or their families well, because again, they were misled by information about COVID or the vaccines or treatments that were inaccurate. You know, Kelly, I've always believed as a doctor that people have the right to make decisions for their health as they see fit. But I also believe that people have the right to have accurate information to make those decisions. And many people have been robbed of the freedom to make the right decision for themselves and their families because of misinformation. It's one of the reasons, Kelly, why in the summer, uh, I issued a Surgeon General's advisory on this topic, health, mis of mis health misinformation, because it actually is costing us uh, in terms of our health and in terms of our lives. Um, but what do we have to do about it? So the first thing I think we've got to do uh, is just recognize uh, off the bat that addressing health misinformation has to be an all of society response. There's no single law you can pass. There's no single program you can institute that's going to tackle misinformation. As individuals, we have to be more conscious about what we share uh, online, recognizing even with the best of intentions, we can share inaccurate information. And uh, if we're not sure, we shouldn't share. That's the new bar that we should hold uh, ourselves to. Uh, the second thing we have to, to do is make sure that we are equipping and empowering uh, healthcare professionals, nurses, doctors, and others in the healthcare sector who are trusted voices to be able to speak to communities uh, about what the truth is and what science tells us you know, about COVID, about vaccines, and about other health topics. Uh, people don't hear enough uh, in communities from voices that are actually qualified to opine on science and health. Uh, and there's another responsibility uh, you know, that I think is worth mentioning here that the technology sector has. Uh, we know when we talk to people and we look at surveys, uh, we find that many people are encountering health misinformation online and particularly on social media. And so I believe that social media platforms have a responsibility to think about how to reduce the spread of misinformation on, on their platforms. These are private, private platforms. They have a lot of data also on where misinformation is flowing, how much it's flowing, what interventions work to reduce its spread. Uh, they need to be public and transparent about that data so that we understand how much misinformation is being transacted. And we also understand uh, what is working and not working to combat its spread. Uh, so these are just a few things that we have to do. And the last thing I'll mention of the many uh, steps we could take as a country has to do with uh, with our own education, how we teach ourselves, you know, and, and to identify information that's accurate versus not. This is something I think about as digital health literacy, uh, right? It's uh, it, This is a, a new world. And we're seeing even now compared to five years ago, uh, it feels like the volume and the sophistication and the speed with which misinformation is spreading has just increased dramatically. Uh, it's not always easy for people to figure this stuff out all on their own. Uh, and so we've got to work with educators, uh, with librarians, with others to ensure that we are increasing digital health literacy uh, in our country so that people are better equipped to understand what's true, what's not, uh, and to get their information from trusted sources. Well, thank you for that. Clearly a, a sort of whole of community approach, whole of government, whole of all of us have to be involved in this, in this discussion. And I'm glad you pointed that out. I wanted to turn for a minute to vaccination. You, you mentioned that right, right away. Of course, this is this amazing opportunity we have right now with vaccines. And yet we have a 
fairly low vaccine coverage in children, our five to 11 year olds, we could perhaps be doing better. Um, can you talk a little bit about that age group and what you think needs to happen and what some opportunities are there? I will. And Kelly, if I could just share one one last thought, though, on misinformation before we leave that, because I know we have a lot of folks who are joining today who are interested in this subject and who help the public understand about this. My worry about our public conversation right now, misinformation, is that it's getting, it's becoming uh, sort of, it's evolving into a conversation solely about censorship versus not. This is not about censorship. This is about common rules for the common good. We know that yes, you know, our freedom to express ourselves to do things in our life is very important. Uh, you know, as Americans, you know, our, our freedom of expression is one of the key reasons why my family and generations of immigrants came uh, to this country, and we want to protect those freedoms. But we also know that when we are we are living together as a community, uh, and that we have to be mindful uh, of the fact that sometimes our actions uh, can have an impact on other people. It's why we have speed limits uh, on, on the road, so that if you choose to drive on the road, you don't take actions that ultimately end up harming other people. Uh, when it comes to misinformation, what we see is that if you are somebody who is spreading misinformation about health, uh, that can have a serious consequence uh, on other people's lives. And in the environment we live in, that information can spread rapidly. Uh, and so I think the conversation we have to have is about how do, we, how do each of us and the roles that we have recognize that we have a voice, that voice has impact, and we have to be responsible about how we share information and avoid sharing misinformation. And if we run social media platforms, if we run organizations, then we also have to think about what's our role uh, to be good stewards of information to ensure that we are doing what we can to create a healthy information environment so that people can get the life-saving information they need. So I just wanted to, to make sure that that was clear, because I do think that to the extent all of us have the ability to inform and guide public conversation, we have to guide the conversation in a way that's constructive uh, and helpful and then doesn't allow us to get mired uh, in what I think of sometimes as uh, sort of ways of thinking about this issue that, uh, that just aren't helpful, you know, and, and that are, are, are not focused on the, the concrete constructive things we could be doing. When it comes to vaccines for kids, um, you were asking my kids under five or, or kids five to 11? Under five. Well, right? I, was, I was starting with the five to 11 year olds. I think we'll yeah. get to the under fives in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I'll tell you as the father of a child who's five, uh, right now, my son, uh, he's a kindergartner, he's five years old. Um, he would want me to tell you he's five and a half. So let me be clear on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but I was very excited when a vaccine became available because, you know, as a parent, I want to do everything I can to protect my child. Uh, and even thank God, you know, the risk to kids with COVID-19 is lower than to older adults. But uh, COVID is not benign in our kids. As you know, we've lost hundreds of children to COVID-19 this year. Thousands have been hospitalized. And we know we can significantly reduce the risk of those with the vaccine, and we can do that safely. Uh, so we're making progress on vaccinating kids who are five through 11, but we are still at a place where we're at under 30% uh, of kids, you know, who are fully vaccinated, uh, you know, in the five to 11 age group. And that means we've just got to do a lot better. Uh, and uh, I think this is about uh, having conversations with uh, parents. It's about making sure they're hearing from their pediatricians and family doctors. It's also about making sure that each of us, you know, are, are talking to the parents in our lives uh, and making sure that they've got accurate information about the vaccine so they can protect their kids. Uh, this is a scary time. And I'll tell you, uh, you know, you know this, Kelly, uh, Kelly, you're a parent too. The pandemic has been really pretty rough for parents. It's not like parenting was a walk in the park before the pandemic. You know, it was full of its own uh, difficulties and balancing work and, and how to uh, and help kids navigate a, an increasingly complicated world. But the pandemic made it much, much harder. And so I recognize that for a lot of parents, it's not so easy to just, uh, you know, find all the sources you need uh, and do all the research you need and then make an informed decision. Sometimes, you know, the pandemic parenting doesn't always allow uh, for all the time that we want to dig into the questions that we have. And that's why I think it's important for those of us who are in public health uh, and in medicine to do everything we can to make sure we are bringing those voices to parents uh, so they can help make informed decisions. What we have done is also We've made sure the supply is there. We've increased the number of access points for pediatric vaccinations for kids five through 11. We've worked with a lot of doctor's offices around the country to get vaccines in doctor's offices, in children's hospitals, uh, in community health centers, so that parents have familiar locations where they can also uh, get this vaccine. Uh, but this is a, we're at a point where we just really need to do much more to get these vaccine rates up. And I think that's then look about looking outside government too and saying, hey, as private citizens, how can we talk to our family and friends? Like we make sure they've got the right information. If they have questions, 
urge them to talk to their doctor because uh, it's never uh, you know it's never too early to get your children protected from COVID-19. We've already seen a devastating Omicron wave that's hospitalized thousands of kids. If we have a wave again in the future, I, I, don't, I don't want kids to, to be subject to more risks than they have to be. Um, the vaccine can reduce that risk. That's why I've been advocating parents strongly consider it. So thanks for that. And I know that you have, uh, you know, a lot of thoughts about kids and, and sort of the health of kids. And now we're facing this under five vaccination strategy, which we're hearing a lot about in the news and wondering what you can tell us about what you, th- how you think this is going to work, how you think it's going to roll out and what you would be saying to parents um, of those who are, who have children under the age of five. Yeah, so it turns out, Kelly, I'm in that category too. I have a second child uh, who is, and my daughter is four. And so my wife and I have been eagerly awaiting uh, the arrival of a vaccine for kids under five. Uh, but here's what I, I would say to parents. And I want to like, be very clear on this because I worry there's been some confusion uh, in um, how people have understood this over the last uh, few weeks. Uh, we do not yet have that vaccine because the data has been requested from the company uh, does not mean that it has already been authorized and then and approved. Um, we, the vaccine has been tested in clinical trials and those trials are ongoing. Um, and w- what the FDA has done is it's requested the company to submit the data for the first two doses so that it can in fact do a thorough evaluation and understand the answer to two critical questions. Is this vaccine safe for kids under five? And is it effective for kids under five? Uh, the trials are ongoing for a third dose. They're also looking at the efficacy of a third dose. Um, but if the FDA finds that the first two doses actually confer benefit and they're safe, uh, then they may recommend, uh, they may authorize uh, that vaccine for kids under five. And then the CDC would consider the data to also determine whether it, it makes a recommendation uh, for kids to get that vaccine. But again, that analysis is what's taking place right now. And on February 15th, the FDA's advisory group will be meeting uh, to publicly discuss this. So this will be a transparent process. People can see the data as well. And only after that will the FDA actually opine. Uh, lastly, let me just say well, it was a word about process. Some people have said, well, doesn't this seem like an unusual process? Is something amiss here? Why is the FDA asking for this data? Let me tell you what changed, right? Because some people remember that in earlier in December uh, that Pfizer, uh, which is doing the trial of the vaccine, had said that it hadn't seen the signal that it wanted for effectiveness and for the first couple of doses, and that's why it was doing a third dose. Something changed, though, between then and now, and that big change was the Omicron wave. The Omicron wave ended up infecting millions of people in our country, and tragically, uh, many children became infected as well. That actually allowed the trial to collect a lot more data. So there is much more information available now than there was in December. And that's why the FDA, recognizing the importance of getting a vaccine for kids under five, wants to leave no stone unturned. And they're asking for that data so they can do their review. But in no way should we assume uh, that because they're asking for it, that their decision has been made. They will not cut any corners in doing the thorough analysis that they know the country has come to depend on them for because they are the gold standard of safety. I think that's really important clarity because there have been some Um, concerns expressed around, you know, why FDA is asking for what they're asking for. So thank you for laying that out really quite clearly. And and Kelly, I would just also urge people to recognize, to to think about the parallel for adults. Adults actually had two doses approved first, a two-dose regimen. And then later, you know, over time, we learned that that we needed to add a booster dose on top of that. So now, uh, we're recommending people get three doses to be up to date, you know, with a Pfizer or Moderna vaccine. Uh, it could be the case that that's how this ends up for kids under five as well. Uh, if the FDA feels the two dose regimen is safe and effective, uh, they may authorize it. And if a third dose down the line ends up increasing protection even further, uh, they may end up authorizing that as well. And, and kids under five may end up like adults, you know, with recommendations for three doses to be up to date. But the bottom line is, um, if they're if it's safe and effective to get kids started now, that's what they'll authorize because that if we can get kids protection sooner, better to do that than to wait. So, Dr. Murthy, speaking of children more broadly, what I know that you've been really concentrating a lot on ch- child and adolescent mental health, and sort of what are some of the impacts of this pandemic uh, on mental health for kids and really trying to raise awareness, I think, around this issue. Can you talk a little bit about what your concerns are and what you think some of the needs are? 
Absolutely. And Kelly, I guess I got to say, like, I'm concerned about all of our men, mental health, you know, but I mean, this pandemic has been tough on everyone. Um, I think parents have had an incredibly tough time. I think uh, so many people have had a hard time during this pandemic, whether it's because of the direct worries about health, losing loved ones. So many of us have lost loved ones during this pandemic or uh, some of the economic uh, fluctuations and, you know, and uncertainties that have been incredibly stressful in people's lives. With kids in particular, though, you know, I think as as resilient as our children are, uh, we have seen that they have struggled both during this pandemic, but also before the pandemic. We saw, for example, that uh, there was a greater than 50% increase in emergency room visits uh, for suicidal uh, for suicide attempts, and suicidal ideation uh, when looking at, at girls. In fact, when you look at boys, there was a 4% increase for them. So a much smaller increase, but still an increase uh, in those emergency room visits. Um, we know that anxiety and depression has increased uh, and for many kids during this pandemic, we know loneliness has also been uh, on the rise for certain children, uh, you know, who, especially in the first year of the pandemic, when they were not able to be in school uh, and weren't around friends or teachers. Uh, so it's been tough. But I think what's really important, Kelly, is for us to recognize what was happening before the pandemic started. You know, in the decade prior to the pandemic, there was a 57 percent increase uh, in the suicide rate uh, among young people uh, in the decade before the pandemic. It was a 40% increase uh, in the percentage of high school students who said they felt persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness. That turns out to be one in three uh, high school students. Um, the indicators were moving in the wrong direction. And whether you look at anxiety, depression, loneliness, uh, suicide, they were at alarmingly high levels. And so even before the pandemic, our kids were, were struggling. And I think the reasons are, are multiple. There's no one single cause uh, that's driving this. Uh, I think it's Number one, the fact that we have to recognize many of our kids have been dealing with not only in person, but also online uh, bullying, which has been a, a real challenge for many kids. Loneliness has been uh, a real struggle for many children, but something they don't talk about very often because uh, of the stigma around it that makes people feel that if you're lonely, something's wrong with you, that you're deficient in social skills, which isn't, isn't the case. Um, the third factor, though, is just to remember that um, many young people uh, you know, are also looking uh, what's happening in their the world around them. And they're seeing the threat of violence in their communities. They're seeing the threat of climate change. They're experiencing and witnessing uh, racism at an individual and institutional level. Uh, and they're asking the fundamental question, is the future better for me? Uh, is there a place for me in the future? And for many of them, they're not sure that the answer is yes. Uh, and that creates its own uh, sort of set of stressors. Um, you put all of these factors together, along with the fact uh, that young people have not had the help uh, that they need in terms of adequate access to treatment, and you have this setup uh, for a mental health crisis among our youth. Um, now, I do believe that we have the ability uh, as a country to solve this. Uh, I think that we have to expand access to treatment, and we've got to make sure that our, our mental health workforce is diverse and pro can provide culturally competent care. We've got to invest in prevention. We actually have, as you know, Kelly, and I know you, you and your team know this, but we have programs that are school-based and community-based programs that work to uh, address mental health issues, even often at either the early stages or before they arise, but we are just not investing in and implementing these programs in schools across the country. And then the third area, in addition to treatment and prevention, is stigma. Right? We, we have to address this terrible stigma that makes people feel that something is wrong with them if they struggle with their mental health, that makes them feel ashamed to ask for help. You can't legislate away stigma. Uh, you can't pay, pass a law that makes it go away. But this is where all of us come in, because the decisions and choices we make about sharing our own story and our struggles can make a difference in how other people look at uh, mental health concerns. The moments that we take to just talk to a child in our life about mental health, uh, to help them understand it's okay if you struggle with the mental health, that it's, okay, that it's okay to have a conversation about it, it's okay to ask for help. These go a long way to helping children recognize that, again, they're not broken. Uh, there's not something wrong with them. It's not their fault uh, if they're struggling. So Dr. Morthy, I think you're, you've really hit upon um, a health issue that predates the pandemic and has moved forward and become perhaps more worse and more uh, somewhat more visible during the pandemic. I think there are other 
uh, public health issues like that. I know that Bloomberg Philanthropies were very uh, engaged in work on overdose prevention, for example, and the overdose epidemic in the U.S. is perhaps another example where um, things have really gotten worse during this pandemic moment. Can you talk a little bit about what the Biden administration is doing around um, overdose prevention and what you see as perhaps some opportunities as we as we start to uh, move forward with our lives now and the pandemic, we hope becomes more uh, more uh, controlled. Absolutely, and and this has um, this has been a crisis uh, for a long time, and I, and I appreciate Kelly the work that you and your team have done for years on the opioid crisis, and um, and unfortunately we're going to need more of that help, you know, as uh, over the next few years because we've seen. Uh, overdose deaths uh, top 100,000 uh, for the year preceding June 2021. Uh, that's uh, Those are the kind of records we don't want to be setting. Um, but when it comes to the opioid crisis, it, it's actually, you can understand how that became worse during the pandemic. Many people were cut off uh, from treatment or it was harder to access treatment, uh, particularly counseling services. Um, we also know that uh, times of stress uh, can often trigger relapse uh, as well. And this was one of the more stressful times, uh, I think, that many people have experienced, uh, you know, in their lifetimes. So uh, th- there are a number of steps so that we have to take here. You know, there's certainly the, the administration, the Biden administration has made uh, a significant investment to help address overdoses. That includes $2 billion in the American Rescue Plan, uh, which have, are now enabling SAMHSA, our Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, to expand access to, to vital services and to support a broader strategy. Uh, around overdose, uh, you know, treatment and prevention. Uh, we've also, and the president in his uh, 2022 budget, uh, asked for $11 billion uh, for the Department of Health and Human Services, which is a little over a 50% increase, actually, from the prior year's budget, with the intent of funding substance use prevention, treatment, harm reduction, and recovery support services. That last one is very important because we don't want to just get people through uh, the crisis of addiction. We want them to. We want to enable them to stay in recovery. Uh, but those recovery support services have traditionally been un- underfunded. Uh, they're incredibly important right now. Um, so the administration also developed uh, a novel overdose prevention strategy uh, to basically bring together uh, agencies across health and human services in a collaborative effort around evidence-based activities uh, in the four areas that I mentioned before. And you know, they've, this strategy is be important because ultimately what we want is the entire administration, all of government, to be rowing in the same direction uh, putting, uh, you know, our best thinking together and using all levers possible to address uh, the addiction crisis. So, you know, when it comes to to addressing the opioid crisis, we've got to continue to focus on the strategies we know work, making naloxone available, increasing access to treatment, integrating that treatment with primary care, uh, which is absolutely essential, and also focusing on investing in those prevention programs, uh, which again, there's a lot of overlap here with the, men- the programs that we know work on the mental health front. Uh, when I was Surgeon General last time, uh, you know, Kelly, I had issued a Surgeon General's report on alcohol, drugs, and health, where we had actually dedicated an entire chapter to school and community-based prevention programs that were not only evidence-based, but they were cost-effective. Uh, and we, on average, uh, with mental health, have seen that with these prevention programs, we save somewhere between 2 to $11 for every $1 invested based on the actual program. Uh, so this is a place, too, where that focus on prevention really matters. But the same sort of stigma that we see with mental health we see with the opioid crisis and with addiction more broadly. And so a key part of this has got to be um, helping people see that it's okay to ask for help. This is why we want doctors and nurses to have conversations with patients. It's why family members starting conversations, talking to your those who are struggling in your lives, it makes such a difference uh, for people to know that they have the love and support of people around them, that they're not letting them down just because they're going through what is a very common and human condition, which is a struggle with a substance use disorder. Dr. Murthy, we have so many questions for you. Uh, I have stacks of them. They're they're breezing in on Instagram and we have so many. Can you just leave us with one positive thought that you have? What's one hopeful thing that you'd like to mention when you look forward uh, in terms of public health uh, in the future? There's so many. I mean, the, and this is, I'm so glad you asked that at the end because if you're an American today and you pick up a newspaper and you read the headlines, uh, it's hard not to despair. Uh, you hear about every crisis uh, in health and 
national security and the economy. You hear about all the things that we have to be worried about. You don't often hear enough about the extraordinary sources of hope uh, and rays of light that are piercing through the dark veil that we've experienced over the last two years. Um, but I find, and just some of them, like I find great hope in healthcare workers, uh, nurses, doctors, others who are showing up day in and day out on the front lines to provide care for people in their darkest hours. And they're doing that even though they're exhausted, even though they're burned out, even though they're worried about their own families, but they're doing that because, you know, they took an oath years ago uh, to relieve suffering and to be there for people in their time of need. And they're honoring that oath at a time where it really matters. Um, at a time where we become so cynical about people's motives and intentions, that reminds me of who we really are and who we can all aspire to be. Um, but the other group that gives me hope, Kelly, are young people. I've spent a lot of time over the last year, um, in part because of my work on youth mental health, doing roundtables uh, with high school students, middle school students, college students uh, in different parts of the country, just talking to them, trying to understand what their experience has been. And I am so often blown away, Kelly, by just how reflective and thoughtful and insightful uh, young people are about the last two years. Uh, yes, it's been incredibly hard for them. Yes, they have struggled. But so many of them have told me how they've used the last couple of years and the hardship it's brought to reflect on their lives and to ask the question, how do I wanna, how do I wanna live my life differently after this pandemic? Some of them are reevaluating their friendships and relationships, focusing more on the people that they love um, and less sort of on uh, social media. Some of them are sort of starting recognizing that uh, perhaps they shouldn't take the people in their life for granted anymore, that they actually wanna be there for their friends and their family. Some of them are, are trying to think about their own future differently, saying, gosh, if, if the world, if anything can happen in the world, maybe I should focus on what I really care about, what I'm really passionate about. Maybe I should figure out what I actually care about and instead of taking other people's ideas uh, to be my own. Yeah, my bottom line is a lot of young people in our country are doing something that I think all of us might benefit from doing, uh, which is asking ourselves the question, how do we not just go back to 2019, but how do we make sure that the future is even better than what we had pre-pandemic? Um, and what they're recognizing is something I think that it's the heart of what's going to help us get through this and future pandemics, which is that our relationships are so important. Uh, they are our, found, our relationships are a foundation for our well-being, for our health, for our happiness. And that's true as individuals, but it's also true as a society. It's why we see even in the research, uh, when people have strong relationships, when people trust one another, those communities have actually done better uh, during the pandemic. Uh, we see that our relationships are a buffer uh, for stressful times. And this has certainly been a stressful time. So whenever I'm feeling um, so, you know, uh, sort of weighed down uh, by everything that's happening in the world. Um, I try to find young people to talk to. I try to find, you know, colleagues in medicine uh, to talk to as well, because their reflectiveness, their commitment to the well-being of others is absolutely inspiring. And it reminds me of who we are inside. We are not uh, by nature, angry, cynical people. Uh, we are not uh, by nature designed to turn on each other and just look out for ourselves. In our best moments, uh, we can be uh, beacons of love, compassion, and kindness. We can support one another. And it turns out that is one of the most important strategies we need for getting through this and future pandemics. It's social cohesion, it's community, and it's social connection. Dr. Murthy, thank you so much for, for ending on that very hopeful note. And thank you for being with us. And thanks to our audience for joining. You can follow Dr. Murthy at surgeon underscore general on Twitter. And you can follow me on Twitter at Dr. Kelly Henning. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kelly. Good to talk to you today.